Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's Michael Staley. My name is Bill Tomlinson, and I'm the director of Software and Application Innovation Lab, also known as SAIL. Before I get started, I do want to give thanks to the folks in the Mass Open Cloud Alliance, the folks in the Rear Institute, and all of the other SAIL collaborators and participants today in this presentation for your time. It's greatly appreciated, and I'm happy to be uh, a cherished collaborator with your ecosystem and happy to continue working together for future endeavors. So the point of this presentation is simply, as it's entitled on the slide, is to showcase the diversity of the domain research projects that exist that are deployed on the New England Research Cloud. From a sales perspective, we will be providing uh, RPIs that will be coming up here that we collaborate with to talk about their particular projects uh, and the, the way that the software products they have will enable their research. And then we have our, our collaborator as well, Nielsen, uh, on the hardware and dark side, giving a list of products as well that also uh, will be they are also the point of merit. So for today, um, the presenter well, is a moderator. I'll be here um, guiding you all throughout the presentation. But from a like, PI perspective, we have uh, Professor David Boas, who's a professor of uh, biomedical engineering and electrical and computer engineering. Uh, assistant professor Naomi Pizzelli, who is in Rock, and she is an assist assistant professor in uh, Deaf Studies at Woodlock College. Professor Douglas Densmore, also in VME and EC. Line, who's here as well, professor at Wheelock College and teaching and learning. And then again, Nielsen and myself will be joining to the presentation. So essentially, every PI will be up here discussing what they talk about with day to day in their research project, but specifically what the software product is that enables it. And then I will be here to answer any questions related to America itself and the funding research that we're using to enhance these products. So, just a little summary before we get going. Uh, this slide is here just to capture the overall impact of NERC currently uh, at the partner institutions. So eight institutions, around 220 users, 55 PIs, and 16 new projects. It's been across the universities you see here on the slide before you. And as I mentioned, uh, the first part of this is to talk about the software products that SAIL itself has developed that are deployed on NERC, and our PIs will be coming to give their own individual perspective research projects and the importance of the software that helps make it. So my first speaker is Professor David Boas and we will talk about his particular application. Please welcome me. Hi, thank you all. So um, I'm going to tell you how we've been interacting with SAIL for just about 16 months now, maybe 18 months. Um, so we, my group has been developing this functional brain imaging technology called the functional brain uh, for measuring brain function in humans. We've been doing that for a very long time. Um, we've been promoting the development in the field. There's thousands of researchers around the world now using this technology. Um, it's, it's kind of like EEG in that you can, you know, you can wear it on your head. Um, but EEG measures uh, electrical activity of the brain. With functional interface microscopy, we're actually measuring the hemodynamic activity of the brain, just very much like fMRI does. Maybe if any of you have heard of magnetic resonance imaging, you can use that to actually get image um, with very good resolution, um, brain activity in humans as they're performing um, different tasks. But they're kind of doing those tasks in the bore of a magnet. It's not very natural. Um, but with functional interface microscopy, we're just putting light sources on the, the head and detectors um, and um, you know, where you were to measure brain function while people are walking around. So a vision we, we or many other people around the world are working towards. Um, as the field has grown, um, and not just our field of functional neuroimaging, but um, neuroimaging in general, and, and, and really just anything in the sciences, um, people are more and more aware of the need to share their data sets. Um, and to share your data sets, you need standards for um, file formats and for data sets. Um, and so we've been working with the, the broader community for the last five years to establish those standards. Um, so about three years ago, we finally released the data file format called SMURF for shared um, near infrared spectroscopy format. Um, and as soon as that was released about three years ago, um, our colleagues started to adopt that into the brain imaging data structure format. So this is a specification um, for data sets which tells you how to organize your uh, data files into a full hierarchical folder structure that is based on the subjects, sessions with that subject, data type, um, or an acquisition method, 
Um, it was originally developed for MRI, extended to um, EEG, magnetoencephalography, like plus transmission tomography, and now FNIRS is part of it. Um, this, this, this is um, a very comprehensive uh, specification for data sets in that there's a tremendous amount of metadata um, that is associated with the experiments. Um, and uh, you want to make sure you capture all of that metadata. So this bid structure ensures that the minimum um, required metadata is there in the data set. Um, as such, it's rather complicated for a researcher to generate a data set which is compliant with this bid specification. So we set out um, at, as, uh, to work with SAIL to create a cloud uh, server, um, a web interface to uh, essentially help users organize their data sets into a, a business compliant structure. And the idea is basically when you acquire brain imaging data, you get a data file in a certain format, um, and then we have this, this web interface that has come together quite nicely now, and it, it's in a closed beta release now. We're going to be opening it up to the uh, general public uh, um, in a few months. Uh, but it basically allows users to upload their acquired data files um, into the appropriate uh, subject folders. Um, and it then uh, creates all the metadata it can, extract it from that acquired data file, and then alerts the user to what metadata is missing, and that's the fill in that data. So it's very useful to help you um, organize your data sets into that uh, um, structure, um, which then is very useful if you want to share the data set with your colleagues um, in your lab, for instance. That is a funny experience we had at the U where helping 10 different labs across the campus um, apply FNIRS to their um, various cognitive science or rehabilitative science uh, experiments, and we told them, organize your data in this specific way. This was before bids. They came back to us and they sent us data in 10 different ways, very you know, uh, which makes it very difficult to analyze data because it's not organized in a common way. So today, what we're doing now because of this BFNIRS cloud, we tell them, upload your data into the BFNIRS cloud, and then we can help you analyze your data. And that's working very well. Um, and, and more and more people around the world are, gonna, are starting to adopt this, and um, we expect this to grow quite well. Um, and then, in the future, as we get more funding, serve as a platform for analyzing our data uh, in the cloud. We can even imagine doing that. Thank you, David. Next up, we have uh, Professor Hank Fine at uh, the College of Woodlock with Professor Teaching and Learning. Uh, Hank is a recent collaborator of ours, and his project is more at the infant stage, but we thought it was best because uh, he has his lofty visions, and uh, we envision that his project is to similar heights that the, the Epidemic Cloud has today. We didn't want to have Nate come and talk uh, to the large mass here to give his vision and talk about this project and his proposed software product will bring to his research. I think uh, the infant stage is called a, a generous way of, of putting it. Um, so I'm a behavioral scientist and see data science as a, as a hobby right now. So I'm learning a lot. Uh, Working with Will and getting you know, Heidi and Rotat collaborators. Uh, our goal is uh, to ensure all kids learn how to read. It's not a it's not a small goal. Uh, they're using papers. We have a crisis on our hands. About one third of kids are not able to read at proficient standards by third grade. Uh, students living in poverty, students with disabilities, with at risk of disabilities. The, uh, the statistics look abysmal. In Boston, I think you have about 80% chance of meeting fourth grade reading standards if you were if you have a disability. <laughs> so, we have been working uh, over the last 20 years uh, with a bunch of university researchers conducting research, reading research studies. And so, we have these huge data sets where we are actively trying to improve reading outcomes for kids with, with and at risk disabilities. And these data sets are multimodal. They have uh, learning data, behavioral data, neuron imaging data. Sometimes we have audio, video data, teachers teaching in the classrooms, students learning to read in the classroom. Uh, we're able to apply traditional statistics to see if we can uh, improve outcomes for kids or not, or examine if what teachers are doing are actually influencing positive learning trajectories. Uh, but we have uh, ideas that we might be able to gain some insights using machine learning. 
more advanced AI applications across these various data sets. And it turns out that that's not, that's not a, a software application that we have to date. Uh, to take multiple data sets, multimodal data sets, and be able to um, apply machine learning statistics and, and, and analytics to those data sets to gain some insights. So we have a, a working group with SAIL and uh, some of the engineers are joining us soon to take these various data sets and be able to clean them, organize them in a standardized way, and then apply some machine learning analytics to gain some insights that maybe we weren't able to gain through traditional statistics. And we've been successful with one-off data sets. Um, the, 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 the game plan, the goal is to be able to offer this to other researchers who have other data sets to, um, to, so that they could uh, access this as well. One of the, uh, the areas that we've been researching is we, in kindergarten, when kids come to school, we uh, don't have the technology to distinguish those kids who have a disability from those kids who just didn't have a high quality, rich learning environment before they got to school. And so the educational service model that we've um, been developing and testing over the last 20 years, early intervention and prevention, the idea is that we give those kids evidence-based interventions and then they don't respond to those interventions, then those children may be uh, candidates for uh, comprehensive evaluations for learning disabilities. Response to intervention is, is the name of this, uh, of this approach. And so across all these data sets that we have, we're trying to examine are there um, factors, teacher factors, neighborhood factors, student factors that predict as early as possible, maybe six weeks, two months into kindergarten, those kids that are going to most likely need um, the protections of special education and more supports and more services from those kids who probably just need a uh, small group reading intervention for, for one year, perhaps to catch them up to their peers. So that's really the, um, the, the goal, is to be able to get these various data sets and put them into a platform in the cloud so that we can gain insights to better support teachers, districts, administrators to identify kids earlier on so that we can support them to be successful makers. I'm not even going to go into it. Our, uh, our uh, technical approach, um, but the idea is that we want to have a, uh, an open side for scientists to be able to put their data into the, into the platform, pose questions, gain insights, uh, advance the field, and at the same time be able to provide direct services to the teachers, parents, community agency members, and students themselves in a more intelligent way. And that's not a part of the, the Red Hat project, but uh, it's one big project for us. Um, yeah. Any questions? Or Thank you very much. Thank you, Hank. We know our next speaker is Douglas Dinsmore. I usually make fun of him because he's a fellow Michigan native, but I'll leave him alone for a day and I'll go and uh, give his song as well. So thanks, Will. Michigan native, so, so he went to Michigan State. I went to the University of Michigan. So there's really no comparison. I really shouldn't bring up Michigan. No. Uh, it's good to be able to come and, and chat with everyone. So I've got this idea for a project. So I'm into arcade games. Anyone who knows me, they're into arcade games. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take pictures of the inside of my arcade games and buy them, maybe where the games are on, and do some thermal imaging of the board, and see the power they're consumed. I'm trying to restore these and see if I can see, oh, this picture of the PCB, there's a part that's hot. And I, maybe that's the wrong chip. But I'm going to upload these to the internet and all that. But the thing that's holding me back in this really cool project is I have to boot a server up, I got to have computing resources in my house, a mainframe, et cetera. If I said that to you, you would say, Doug, that's silly. Why are you setting up that computing infrastructure in your house for that project? Why don't you use the cloud? 
Nobody, for the most part, when they want a website or some computationally heavy service, makes a mainframe, makes a large server farm. They use the services that this conference is talking about. But on the flip side, in biology, if I want to make it a drug, or I want to make a microbe that responds to toxins in the environment, or I want to make a new material from an engineered bacteria or yeast, I have to have a lab. There's no notion of sending that design experiment to the cloud. And so what I'm trying to do with my research here through an operation called the DAM Lab, which stands for Design, Automation, Manufacturing Processes, is to make that cloud for biology. And the kinds of things we're trying to engineer are therapeutics, fuels, materials, sensors, and so that it democratizes the field so that when any of you want to do that kind of biological resource, you don't need your server. You don't need your lab. How do we go about doing that? And so this is what this project is involved with. Because if you want to sit down and design an engineered microbe or a yeast or a mammalian cell, what does the software look like? You say, I want an ATCG. You say, well, I just want to make it that if this bacteria comes in contact with heavy metals, it glows yellow. How do you do that? Well, one approach is to say, I want to build something and I have a menu of services. So if I went to Taco Bell and I wanted to make some new recipe, I'd say, well, I want a tortilla, I want some beans, I want to do it this way, I want guacamole. And you look at their menu and you assemble the things you want to get the meal eaten. So what the DAM lab is doing is providing 40 plus more or less microbiology services. So these are things related to DNA cloning, fluorescent assays, transcriptomics, basic storage and retrieval, liquid handling, we have a menu, and then you go to a software interface that SAIL is developing, and you literally drag and drop those services on a canvas, and you wire them together. And when you wire them together, it's implicitly creating a schedule that's gonna be sent remotely to the lab, and it's the same lab here at BU that did all the COVID testing. So the DAMP lab, for those of you who didn't know, has consumed or reabsorbed the same infrastructure that did 9,000 COVID tests a day for the campus. And so we're offering that capacity now to the entire BU community as a core facility. But again, the sale effort is to, again, expose these kinds of things. Transparency in the status of your job. It'd be no good if you send something to your, the cloud for computing and it said, we'll get back to you when we feel like it. You don't want that in biology either. You want to say, well, here's the expected turnaround time, the quality, the parameters that I can expose to a user and that they can give to the lab, the kind of freedom. So again, the idea is that we have human technicians, just like that Taco Bell analogy, there's an assembly line of people who do things in a very standardized way, but we also have a series of liquid handling robots and automation equipment that carries this out. So again, the challenge to sale was what might that look like, how they build that infrastructure. And it's ultimately powered by the traditional computing cloud. So when someone sends their job in, there's back-end processing, there's scheduling, there's resource allocation, all of those kinds of things. So again, you can imagine the front end kind of shown here on the left is this idea, you can kind of, you don't need to see the details, but you can roughly see again, you have a canvas and you're dragging and stitching together the services. And this, what you'd like to do is have that available for a variety of users. Power users will say, I'll double click on that, I'll go and I'll monkey around with the parameters, I'll set some things very specifically for that process to happen. But a more naive user might say, well, I just want this general thing, can you tell me what the parameters are? I'm gonna say, well, the output of this cloning experiment which produces DNA, I want you to tell me if it works, what assays might tell you that it works, so we'll then propose those. You can imagine that the back end is gonna be learning about the types of workflows people put together. You then go and put your data back there. It says this experiment worked, this one didn't. Eventually, if you do that enough, those become rules that prevent people from stitching things together. And then also for you that are not familiar with this area, you might be thinking, oh, they're engineering bacteria, they're engineering yeast, they're engineering mammalian cells. That sounds potentially tricky, both ethically and from a security standpoint. The other thing that happens in this flow is there's a security checking process. So we say who's making what, how's it being made, it goes about making sure all the biosecurity is in place. So again, what we're trying to enable is the same way you guys all think, well, I want to do some really cool computing. You never would think about putting up your own server farm. In the future, 
if you want to engineer biology, you would never think I need to have a lab. You would just go to the cloud, and the software will power that. So thanks to Sale. It's been great working with everyone, and, and thanks again for listening. Thank you, Dave. Next up, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Assistant Professor Naomi Caselli, uh, who has been uh, a Excel collaborator prior to me to join Excel. Um, so we want to go her and talk about her important work um, in her field and product that helps superhead all Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm I've been working with Excel for a couple of years. I don't know what my years at this point. Um, yeah, Naomi Caselli, I'm the uh, co-director of the AI and Education Initiative, and I also run the um, new Center on Sign Language and Deaf Education. Um, and the, the reason that I do the work that I do is because um, I care a lot about sign language and about deaf kids um, and, and deaf people. Um, ASL, American Sign Language, was my first language along with English. Um, we used it in my house because my dad was was deaf, and I feel really lucky that I had access to two languages starting at the time that I was born, and was able to learn them and use them throughout my life, and, and communicate and really um, uh, connect with lots of people in, in lots of different ways. But it turns out that the way that um, I was really lucky, lots and lots of deaf people aren't so lucky. Um, deaf kids don't automatically have access to sign language, and um, and deaf adults have to communicate through an interpreter a lot of times. Classes, other sorts of things aren't aren't as accessible. And and I think we've gotten to kind of an era where our um, uh, capacity for um, computer vision and AI and natural language processing um, have put us on the precipice of maybe having technology that could um, augment some of that communication, could aid in translation, for example or to make it possible to um, access your email through American Sign Language instead of having to do it through um, your second or third language, um, or, English or, or another written language. The big, re the big reason that we don't have these technologies yet and that sign language technology is really trail um, at this point is not so much, I mean, there's, there's plenty of open, open questions in terms of AI and ML, but one of the big uh, big reasons that we don't have these technologies is data. Um, having a large scale data set of sign language that's labeled in a way that you can actually build a model around it, um, it is, is a not trivial challenge. It's easy to film lots and lots of sign language. I can run my camcorder or whatever. I've been able to do that for 20 years. I can, I can do that for lots and lots of hours, but figuring out what exactly people are saying in a way that you can teach computers is, is much more challenging. And so I've been working with the, uh, the folks at SAIL to try and develop infrastructure to make that possible. So we've um, one of the projects that we've been working on is, is Sign Lab, um, which is a software that lets you uh, collect sign language data, rapidly segment that so you can find where each uh, sign is, is starting and ending and then tag those data in uh, those signs so that we know in some reliable way what's being said. Um, and, and that's been, been a challenge. American Sign Language and English aren't the same, so you can't just um, type an English label for every sign. You've got to, uh, there are different signs that translate to, to different words. Um, there's not always a one-to-one -one translation, same as for, for any languages. There's not, you know, there's plenty of things that get lost in translation. And so what we've done is we've come up with a system that lets you use American Sign Language to label American Sign Language and kind of circumvent this, this problem. But that, that's required um, building some software to, to, to let you do that um, and, and to label it. Um, and with that, we've been able to create the biggest data set for American Sign Language to date. We are, hopefully, we'll see, we'll, we'll see if we get this application through, hoping to, to use what we've done um, uh, around American Sign Language to extend these data sets to other sign languages around the world. Yes, there are other sign languages around the world. Um, uh, and, and, and we've been able to we've been able to be really successful. We can get a model to, to recognize signs with 90% accuracy already and, and we haven't even uh, haven't even gotten uh, gotten all the way there yet. So um, that's one of the big projects that we're working on. The other one is actually the the project that we started working on with SAIL um, 
five, six years ago, is on ways of making those data publicly accessible. So instead of just housing the data in, in, a, in a university where technologists have access to that data, we're trying to make it accessible to deaf people, to teachers, to, um, to students. And so we've done that through ASL Lex, which is a lexical database for ASL that's got an interactive visualization that lets you explore the American Sign Language lexicon. You can find that if you Google it. Um, you can see ASL Lex, which, uh, which the Seattle folks helped us build. It's an award-winning visualization. We won the, the uh, Popular Science Disease Award for our visualization work there. And people use it a lot, um, ASL learners, um, people who want to know a little bit more about ASL, it's a way for you to kind of browse, um, browse it, learn all about it. And uh, yeah, thanks to the field for really supporting us through um, in making that possible for the past seven years. Yeah, before I pass it on to my colleague, uh, Wilson, just want to reiterate that these are software products that we envision. Being maintained on this production cloud environment, you definitely make decision. These are these are right lock and step with the traits we're absorbing from sale our management point that the research products coming from PIs are no longer just the two for three months and simply wrap up, study, and conclude and go home. These these things are designed to scale and have users and features over time and, and really having a production cloud with flexibility to meet those needs is a very important thing. And we're thankful for the folks who have helped orchestrate her and the things that's brought to bear so far to come to these goals. And we look forward to what is to come over the horizon. Um, this is a snapshot of what we have to say in terms of resources currently in there. I mean, we were, we've been transitioning workloads um, over like less than a year already. Uh, so things are slowly pushed onto this as part of this coming to our ecosystem. We are naturally pushed into this pattern as well. We envision these numbers that you see here growing and scaling. Even over the next few months, uh, based on our trajectory here. A couple other notable products that I have here listed. Um, one is through the uh, public private partnership with the mayor's office and the Boston Women's Workforce Council, which is essentially a data collection tool uh, that leverages multi party computation to help to obfuscate the centers of the data to help to measure the gender and racial wage gaps collectively across the greater Boston area. Uh, we have our own authentication microservice, so we have a suite of microservices that we're developing that. Hard to put on Merck, but our dedication service was the first to be dropped on Merck. And then we work with Framing and Mark Study uh, on a number of different projects, but right now, most of them is a proposal assessment system uh, for a particular uh, type of research proposal that they ingest in their platform to help uh, go sign and to grade and to deliberate on the result to provide funding to the state. Uh, so just to wrap up that this is a very important project, not only to their own research fields, uh, not only to sell, um, to the community as a whole, and we hope to continue to have the resources to maintain them for years to come. I'm going to pass to my colleague Wilson, who's going to give similar flavor of talks, but uh, with Bentley Harvard and their research projects at the forefront. So I'm here to present some of the interesting use cases that are using specific companies. Microphone. Bentley, Harvard, and Northeastern. Uh, so I'm presenting those PI and the others. So the first, the first project is titled NIS funding drop and analysis. So this was uh, this is from Edward, Matthew, and Fred. Um, they are trying to create a dashboard that allows users to search for crops and biological products. So this provides a year-by-year -year detailed breakdown of NIS funded grants from year 1999 to 2020. And this tool offers insightful information for the funding uh, patterns for the crop research. And uh, the breakdown is done uh, on the basic research as well as on the applied research. So the grant are categorized uh, by the government institutions as well as grant writers. So this is very important for the researchers to get the insight and also export those data for the research also as well as for the collaborations. So the dashboards provides a useful insights for the researcher grant 
uh, writers as well as policy makers. The interface looks like this, where we can see the drugs as well as their virus targets and the corresponding visualizations as so another project is titled Newspaper Database Project. Uh, this is from Professor James Snyder and Mitcha from Harvard University. So the main challenge of this project is uh, to design a database that is robust and also store large amount of uh, storage and also support for uh, full text searching uh, with high accuracy as well as high speed. So we suggest them to use Elasticsearch and uh, most of the time, considerable amount of time is spent to scrap uh, those data from uh, US Library of Congress as well as uh, uploading them to the Elasticsearch. source. So also they optimize the source time by providing the source key, key keywords so that those keywords are not too narrow, uh, that do not miss any important data as well as not to board so that they can select redundant or irrelevant data. So on NERC side, they are using two Ubuntu powerful machines. One is for the main uh, deployment and another is for the testing. So they are using around 4.5 terabytes of storage for storing all those data from the newspapers. And also we provide the technical support for them uh, both the servers as well as the plastic source database. So the main primary outcome of this research is uh, the development of the highly scalable database and also uploading those um, data from them. And also substantial amount of time is spent on curating and continually uh, uploading those data on the, on the database. And they are also developing a framework to extract a subset of the database that are leaning towards some political views and also trying to test them with several keywords. So, so future work, they want to use this political subset of uh, data set and then perform some uh, classification tasks and also label those data so that they can do or from some natural language processing as a um, root or base one. So another project is titled Particle Flow Code 2D. It's a PFC 2D version 7 uh, model. And this is from John Saw, uh, Andrews Place, and Christian Chiaima from Harvard University. So the main objective of this project is to understand understanding of the ground surface observed during large earthquakes. So the approach they implement is combining the studies of seismic ground surface structures and analog sandbox for the experiment to inform geomechanical models. And they implement the method called EM. So it's a distinct element method. And their finding is a, a parameter that affects the ground Deformation characteristics like lip, height, width. And also, they found out uh, the key parameters influencing the scrap morphologies. And the key finding of this research is the localized fault scraps are prominent in strong sediment on steeply deep falls, whereas broader deformation is prominent in deeper sediment on steeply deep falls. So, out of this, they propose a uh, uh, propose a fault scrap classification system, and this model can be uh, used for deterministic and for other assessment in fault displacement hazard analysis. And they found that DEM is a suitable method for modern uh, geological geologic processing uh, processes of faulting and granular mechanics of soils and sediment deformation in the shallow soil. So the future of this kind of research can be used in earthquake hazard analysis and mitigation so that we can uh, minimize the loss of lives and also damage of structures. So on the north side, uh, they are using uh, 80 trials to run on NERC. Uh, they need uh, 
uh, operating system, both Windows as well as Linux. And each trial takes around five to nine hours, and each trial generates 5.6 to 11.2 GB of data. So they opted with uh, GPU A102. That's a GPU flavors that is available on there, with 24 cores and 192 GB of RAM. And they found out that each trial, uh, each trial requires uh, like 40% of the CPU and 45% 40 of the RAM from the machine. So they can run two parallel trials at the machine. And another project is titled Functional Annotation of Variation, Variance Online Research. It's a favor, favor, and also variant annotated for large whole genome sequencing studies. Favor, favor. So this is from Q Feng and other team members from Geome Bean Lab, and they are uh, trying to achieve these goals. Like they want to design a database. That sequence that has a data from whole genome sequencing, and that consists of data around 32 terabytes. And also, they want to have a web portal that leads to those data, and also uh, have a scalable annotator on top of it. And they have implementation on different cloud native platforms like NERV and Alder. So, the main use case of favor star. Also, we annotate large uh, whole genome sequence studies and also facilitate uh, rare variant association studies. So they choose Favor as the uh, backing database uh, that is based on posters because this is easily available to integrate other existing databases. And they have around 8.89 billion of total variants. And that includes 15 annotations in 30 categories and also a wide range of integrated stores. And beside that, it supports the indexing so that um, we can do quick single variant or reason and single variant uh, label annotation queries and also provides the summarized statistics. So, this diagram shows the high level view of this project. And as I said, they need a database and the querying. Uh, online web portal and also the scalable annotator that can query on single variant uh, as well as reason and gene level variants. So currently they are using uh, Google Cloud and the interface looks like this, but they already migrated it into NERC with the modern and user friendly interface. And they already um, found out that this substance this is increasing the response time on NERC rather than using the Google Cloud. So another project is titled Enabling Geospatial Research using high performance computing from Wayne Yuan and David Cocker from CCA Group at Harvard. So this group supports and uh, supports the research and teaching across all disciplines in the Harvard that are related to the geospatial uh, technologies and methods. So primarily, they focus on analyzing the big data uh, on geospatial field. They support those tools and methods, and also they program them. And also, they uh, provide the resource required to scale them uh, so that they can process those big data. And beside that, they also uh, develop uh, and design platforms that are supposed to visualize those big data processes. So this brilliant object platform is already hosted on NERC, and this has around like 1 billion geotags, geo, geotag scripts, and also they implement sentiment analysis using natural language processing on the web. As they already have the geographic in, enhanced data, so they can use that data set to develop some user interfaces and dashboards. This shows the output of this project, uh, by Hex, sorry. So user can filter the data uh, using different keywords. For example, they can search on the Twitch text, like they can search for climate. 
And this will allow not just searching for keywords, but also they can search on space and time. So you can see the response time for this amount of data is quite fast because the backend uh, infrastructure used on this project is more like GPU compute based infrastructure on top. You can see they can search on a range of date and that will narrow down the search results. As well as they can search on a specific locations like we can search for post on how many tweets I'm talking about finding. So you can see this narrow down the search. So this kind of infrastructure is quite powerful because it's super fast and also more uh, user scalable. So this kind of data set can also be used on other use cases like climate change and impact and psychological well-being as well as global sentiment uh, analysis during the COVID-19 pandemic. So those are two use cases. Uh, some of the publication out of our issues is from Arjun Bua and his team from Northeastern University. So the first paper they published is either two machine learning uh, models for his time script that are uh, adapt type check. So we know time inference is a key problem in programming languages and there are some projects that try to solve this problem by using machine learning. But this paper tried to um, present the limitation of the existing efforts and try to address them in a kind of uniform manner. So they use NERC. Uh, for this, they need uh, GPU-based virtual machines. So they use A100 GPU nodes to evaluate those problems. And also, interestingly, this kind of infrastructure is helpful for the reviewers so that they can access them as well as uh, they can evaluate the uh, research work. So the reviewer from ECOP is a European conference on object-oriented programming. They are able to uh, access those resources on NERC and then evaluate the work published in this paper. So another project is titled Recode uh, Responsible Neural Code Generation Models. So this is a collaboration between industry and Northeastern. Uh, especially from common case, service our resource, and models. So Big Code is an open source scientific collaboration tool that is responsible for development of many uh, language models for code as well as empowering machine learning tools. And Northeastern is uh, the key lead on this to evaluate the performance of this Big Code and they are using NERC to evaluate those performance using some uh, compute resource as well as the GPU resources. And this paper has published and also received the best award uh, at the Deep Learning for Code DL4C workshop. Yeah. So these are some of the great use cases that are using NERC. And um, uh, so you can think about having on-premise cloud services for any research need. And we provide all the uh, cloud native um, infrastructure as well as storage and public resources for your uh, research. Yeah, so if you have any questions. My question is very simple. What is the biggest hurdle, now that we've done this for a little bit, for a researcher wants access to the system, so they're productive and they're doing research? What do you feel like is, like, 
when you engage with someone else and the others in sale, and you're doing that engagement, what is that thing that you're doing that helps them? To yeah. So the main heart of it is like they they know the problem and they don't know the like how can they solve those problems, right? So we can offer them the technical expertise and also give them the solution by like, like architecting the problem. For example, in this problem uh, on the database project, they don't know, they have the data, but they don't know about like, how can they store that kind of relations of data. So we can support them like giving some technical solutions like uh, on the technical aspect of the problem and then uh, yeah, supporting those because resources on learn can be used and use for that purposes. Something? Right, I just wanted to add one, one more piece to that. Uh, so from sales perspective, one thing that we need to talk about uh, is the management of, of bugs and troubleshooting software that comes out when it's already in production. So I think another element to add is that you said we've instantiated our own method of having CICD pipelines that facilitate um, rapid updates to go with this art for no I think that from a, from a once it's operationalized standpoint, being able to maintain operation in a more seamless fashion, that's a thing you add as well. Do you teach the researchers the CI and software engineering methods then? So not the researchers per se as a PI, but we at SAIL offer that, uh, that software best practice consulting to students and students in their lab as well uh, as, as an option. And so it's, it, it also that sense of being able to maintain the software over time. The SAIL is sort of the foundation unit here is that we try to maintain that competency and that, that knowledge base such that as students uh, undergrad, graduate, postdocs transition, and we, they still has someone has institutional knowledge to be taken. So earlier today, the Massachusetts political um, group said that they um, <coughs> initiated having NERC come into existence for all of this research. How does the New England version of cloud computing for academia compared to other countries like California or Europe? Yeah, so so like we have on like on-prem industry level cloud services provider. So people like if you think about having cost saving and more responsive uh, power setup then rather than going to others. Uh, you can opt it for giving like this is not. So, like I said, on some of the use cases, people are still evaluating the performance uh, on public cloud versus using on private cloud. So, they are already seeing some substantial change on the response time as well as the cost will be getting involved on the. So I have a question for the DAMP lab. So how would I think differently about this infrastructure regarding intellectual property? I'm trying to get my head around using a public cloud with IT resources, using programming. So you're dealing with physical things, I believe. So how do you protect? I don't know that you have a level of abstraction that could hide the idea sufficiently to prevent any kind of theft? Yeah, so that's a good question. So on some level, you could make the case that if you're a biological manufacturing entity, the end result is just the sequence. So if that sequence is your secret sauce, that makes that protein that you really want protected, how might you, um, how might you obst you want to make sure that's, that's secure. So for folks that have strong IP concerns about the actual DNA sequence, some of those things we end up partnering more intimately with them as a, as a manufacturing facility. So as a core facility, they come, they may not go through that same interface, they may say we want to partner, we have to put an IP agreement in place with the university. Those folks are relatively rare. So most of the folks, just like 
Their IP is actually how they're going to be using it once they get the information from us. They're going to get something, they're then going to take that, engineer it, maybe put it together with something they have at their own facility, put that into a host organism, they're going to boot that up differently. So in the case that it does matter, we work with them more closely. Many people don't care. And there are some things that I think are just basic computational infrastructure security things that are just completely computer science about how we encrypt things, how we have a secure database, how we do those. And that's where sale can really be helpful. That we can minimally say that the infrastructure is as secure as industry standard. So those things are helpful because they know now it's not me running something in my lab. So they feel safe about those things. The other place that I don't want to talk too long is this idea about material transfer. So you do get something and you have to send it to someone. How do we make sure that's secure? That's an entirely different discussion about how we do material transfer agreements, but we're working on how to make those also robust and we're sending things to. It's a whole good discussion though. Any more questions? All right, well, thank you folks. I'll turn it back over to you.